Across Sydney, a small army of workers are reshaping an entire city, building a revolutionary metro system for the 21st century and beyond. When it's complete, this new driverless railway will have dozens of new stations, more than 150 kilometres of track, and create a giant loop around Sydney. But with mega ambitions come mega challenges. Major buildings to demolish in the CBD. Giant holes to carve deep underground. And more than 60 kilometres of tunnels to dig beneath the city. Eight monster tunnel boring machines are conscripted. North of the harbour, four TBMs dig eastwards and two dig southwards. And south of the harbour, two more tunnel their way northwards towards the CBD. Everything in their way is reduced to rubble. At the Barangaroo station site, design manager Ali Shad and the team are dealing with a startling discovery. We found the oldest Australian-made boat. See where that hole's been dug over there, next to the hull? That's where we've got the keel. Marine archaeologist Cosmos Coronius has uncovered where the boat was built. Yeah. It's made out of Sydney blue gum, stringy bark and spotted gum, so local timbers. And that's what helped us conclusively say that it's an Australian-built vessel. It's a wonderful find for archaeology, but the unearthing of this 180-year-old boat risks hindering progress. Every day the archaeologists work is a day lost excavating the 25 meter deep station box. But after three long months, all the pieces have been tagged and removed and will now be scientifically examined and analyzed. So the archaeologists have finished taking the, the boat away and we can now really get stuck into the excavation of the station. Excavation was delayed in the area around the boat, and the race is on to make up lost time. The massive steel beams suspending the road are extended. Concrete is poured over one section. A roof is added so the team can work around the clock while keeping the dust and noise in. Beneath the roof, to make up for the lost time, excavation is back at full pace. With the harbour right next to the site, they don't want major water inflow. And so far, so good. The material down there is quite dry. We're not getting major water inflows, which is something you'd expect next to the harbour. Steve Kotovich is the construction manager at Barangaroo. Under pressure to get back on track, time is Steve's enemy. Time and water. It would be tough going if we were to get a lot of water inflow. The truck's taking that material out of the hole. You know, a lot of material would be falling out of the back. All in all, it would just create a, a tougher environment. Down here, necessity is the mother of invention. And building this massive ramp from excavated rock, or spoil as it's known, was a masterstroke. We're utilising this ramp as long as we can. We're sort of on the absolute limit now as to how much more we can go. By having the ramp, it's helped us out a lot in that we can get the dirt out, you know, as quick as we can, which is really what we're here for, to get this excavation done as quick as possible. The ramp raises their game and writes the schedule, but it's a temporary fix. Over the next couple of weeks, the ramp will be phased out and we'll be lifting the dirt out using the clamshell excavator that you see over there. No ramp means no direct access for trucks deep below. The pace drops. Cranes are now called in to get dirt out to trucks on the surface. Still, 2,000 tonnes of dirt a day are moved out, threatening to add to congestion on Sydney streets. The Barangaroo team must find another way to ship out its mountain of spoil.
So what's unique with the Barangaroo site is that the material that we're disposing from here is leaving our site via a barge. At the other sites, we're, we're taking the spoil away by truck. You know, it, it adds traffic to the city. Here, we've got a brilliant transport path using the harbour. Behind me is the conveyor system. This conveyor is used to load the crushed material inside the spoil shed onto the barge that's parked on the waterfront. One barge can carry about 60 truckloads of spoil. It's all stowed away to keep the neighbours happy. We are in one of the prime vantage points of Sydney. There's a lot of high rise around us. The minute we get a, a speckle of dust or, or a slight plume, the phone calls run hot. Doing everything we can to keep everybody happy. And that includes recycling. This Barangaroo spoil is shipped up the harbour for use on other construction sites. As the station box gets deeper, walls of exposed rock tower over the underground site. Like a giant gemstone, the rock face is honed to reveal the natural beauty of the Sydney sandstone. It looks as solid as rock, but sandstone is porous, so water finds its way through. It begins to pool at the bottom of the box. It's a challenging environment. It can get wet, it can get muddy. And until we've waterproofed the whole station and lined it so that the water can't get in, we've got to keep pumping it away. There's a lot of water coming in, so we've just got to make sure that the pumps are working fine. As pumps work full pace to keep the box dry, this operation could get stuck in the mud. And as more machines are drafted in, things get a bit too cosy for comfort. The logistics is going to get really, really tricky making sure that there's enough space for everybody to work in and everybody's not climbing over each other. Just metres offshore from Barangaroo, right near the Harbour Bridge, a geotechnical team are preparing for a risky mission to discover what lies beneath. Engineers need to know what type of rock they'll be tunnelling through deep below the harbour floor beneath the sand, silt and sludge. Ideally, there's only sandstone, like the surrounding city, perfect for tunnelling. Engineers will try to drill sample cores up to 80 metres below the water surface. They must know exactly what kind of material will be both above and below the tunnels. As the sun sets, two drilling rigs head out armed with the geologists' coordinates. This is a working harbour and busy transport hub. So in the interests of safety, the team must burn the midnight oil. We're drilling on a waterway that is the most trafficked waterway in Australia. World-renowned geologist, Dr David Ock, is overseeing the drilling. It can only begin in the dead of night, well after the rush hour has passed. This is probably the first time this sort of work's been undertaken on a harbour without interruption from major vessels, fuel tankers and cruise liners. The platforms need to drill more than 50 boreholes and probes, all the way from the southern shore to the north. It's a six-week job. As each core sample comes in, it is carefully analysed and a map of the harbour floor takes shape. Still quite, this, this is actually cohesive in size. Yeah, the sun is just from, uh, it's just a kind of veneer. There are some remarkable findings. Ah, oh, becoming sandy here. Yeah. In one section, the harbour floor is 21 metres deeper than previously thought. Yeah, oh, that's, yeah, that's sand. Far more concerning, towards the middle of the harbour, there's no rock. Oh, yeah, look at this. Wow. There is instead soft, mushy yeah, sediment. Be, that's interesting. Look, it seems like um, a bit of timber. It could be timber, actually. I agree. Yeah. Look at this. That's pretty exciting. I'm covering the harbour, right? Amazingly, the core samples contain fragments of charcoal and timber. Wow. 
from 50 metres below the surface. Yeah, so this material here is just charcoal timber, probably a bushfire material that's just floated down the ancient Sydney harbour and deposited in the sand. Probably the first time these have been brought out in the open for nearly 20,000 years. During the last ice age, the harbour was not a harbour. It was instead a valley covered in forests with a small river running down the middle of the valley towards the sea, which was then 25 kilometers further east. As sea levels rose, the ocean advanced west. The valley was flooded and the forests drowned. The geotechnical results provide a wonderful insight into Sydney's remarkable past, but they make alarming reading for engineers. Instead of boring through stable, solid sandstone, tunnelers will face clay sediments. The remains of the ancient riverbed right in the middle of the harbour. It's a daunting prospect especially with the massive weight of the harbour pressing down from above. Most of Sydney is full of sandstone, a bit of a tunnelless dream. It's like carving out a bit of a hole in Swiss cheese. Really easy, really stable sort of material. But if you dive down under the water here, what you'll find is slush and sediment. And if I'm a tunneler, that's not my dream anymore. That's actually like trying to tunnel through yoga. So imagine trying to cut a hole in yoga and hope that that hole will stay there without doing anything. That's what our tunnelers have got to do when they try and get under this harbour. This little section from one foreshore to the other is an area that we're particularly concerned about getting right from an engineering point of view. First and foremost, we want to keep our construction workers safe while they're building it. And in the long run, we want to make sure that that tunnel is secure, not just for the next few years, but for the decades and centuries ahead. In Guangzhou, China, the last TBM to roll off the production line is a very special rig. Called a slurry machine, its only job is to get through the soft ground beneath the harbour. Her name is Kathleen. Named after Kathleen Butler, the technical advisor to Sydney Harbour Bridge engineer, John Bradfield. And while Kathleen Butler went over the harbour a century ago, her namesake is going deep under it. Her international crew has come to the factory, checking her systems. The visual is open. Thank you. There's Michele Petris from Italy. On the visual is closed, V14. I feel very excited because I was waiting this moment since long time. It was a year of preparation, and now finally we have the machine ready to go, so I can really wait the moment to, to see the cutter head turning the first day. Leading Kathleen's team will be Andreas Mint from Germany. He knows the conditions that await him beneath Sydney Harbour are perilous in the extreme. You remember from your childhood days, building a tunnel on a sand pit or, or out in the dirt, it's very soft material, so if you try to build a tunnel in this type of material, it just collapses naturally. To stop the soft sediment or yogurt collapsing into the machine, the front of this TBM is highly pressurized, pumped full of liquid bentonite and high pressure air to repel the pressure of the sediments and mud and stop it from flooding into the machine. So we basically create an equilibrium between the existing pressure in the, in the ground and the TBM, which is excavating the tunnel, making sure we don't get any collapse of the tunnel whilst we move forward. Using high-pressure machinery underground is fraught with danger. So just behind the TBM's nose section are two hyperbaric chambers. When we do work in the front, when we have to do maintenance on the cutter head, people need to go into this chamber. These small airtight rooms provide access to the nose section and also serve as compression and decompression chambers for the crew. Working in compressed air is like diving. You might now, when you go diving, when you come up, 
it takes some time to slowly come up. It's very much the same here when we do compressed air work. Without the chambers, the crew would suffer the bends. Kathleen's crew must be able to handle working at the high pressure business end of the machine. We will train them on how to work in here, how to react if there is an emergency, and uh, to ensure that they can work safely and carry out those works. You'll always need to get in to check the cutter head. You have the scrapers here as well. You have a lot of wear parts on it, and you always need to go into the front to check. It's really important on any machine that's in the front line. It's a potentially hazardous operation, far beneath the seabed, where nothing is more important than the safety of the crew. The challenge uh, of this job is, first of all, to keep a safe in environment for everybody, because we are excavating under the harbour. When we are tunnelling under Sydney Harbour, there are no second chances. Rod Staples, the city's transport chief and architect of the Sydney Metro project, is wary of the risks and dangers that lie ahead, tunnelling under the harbour. He heads to the UK to inspect a recent tunnelling project firsthand. In London, as in Sydney, these train tunnels had to be dug beneath a major waterway. In this case, the Thames. Simon Wright leads the British project. It's a bit more like trying to cut through yoghurt. The moment you dig it out, it all falls in on itself. Mm. We have a lot of uh, yoghurt. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, but London clay is perhaps a bit more cheese-like. It's a kind of fairly solid yoghurt. Pleased to say that the ground control, the settlement of the yoghurt collapsing in on itself was pretty good, thankfully. How are you doing with that? Uh, Simon takes Rod on a tour of his cross-rail project. It's uh, 50 mil. Where tunnelling sometimes came extraordinarily close to existing infrastructure. We had to weave our way between the existing northern line and an escalator barrel. It was about 380 millimetres under the escalator barrel and about 500 millimetres above the northern line. So Those the two. TVM was only that far Literally away? Literally that far away. Yeah. And, and In the highly specialised world of mega engineering projects, the best learn from the best. If major programmes can learn from each other globally, and build upon this library of data and information and good practice, then we will all get a lot better, a lot faster at what we do. But engineers are a competitive bunch, especially when the title of world's best metro is up for grabs. For me, the battle will be won or lost on the systems and getting the testing commissioning right. I'll back us to have the best customer outcome. Oh, well, there you go. We'll see. We'll take a ride on each other's railway and we'll uh, I'll have a glass of wine on the outcome. How's that? Look forward to it. Thank you. Well done. Cheers. <laughs> Eight out of ten sore throats are caused by virus.